Hello, I'm Tom Wilkinson, and welcome to the Thinking in English podcast, a podcast aimed at intermediate to advanced level English learners. On Tuesday, the 24th of August, the opening ceremony of the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games was held. Although the Paralympics tend to attract less attention than their more famous counterparts, the Olympic Games, they are an excellent showcase of incredible athletes with amazing stories. This episode of Thinking in English will introduce what the Paralympics are, some of the history behind the competition, and end by discussing the potential legacy of Tokyo 2020. But first, why not follow the Thinking in English Instagram page, Thinking in English podcast, or the link is in the description. And you definitely should look at my blog, thinkinginenglish.blog, for all the transcripts and some bonus content. Here is today's vocabulary list. As always, the written list is available in the description of the podcast and also on my blog, thinkinginenglish.blog. Packed. Packed. Packed is an adjective that means completely full. For instance, the train was so packed that I couldn't find a seat. Spine tingling. Spine tingling. If something is described as spine tingling, it is very special and exciting. As in, watching Usain Bolt win the Olympic 100 meters was one of those spine tingling moments. Amputee. Amputee. An amputee is a person who has had an arm or a leg cut off due to illness or injury. For instance, as he is an amputee, he uses a special blade to help him run. Impairment. Impairment. An impairment, I guess, is the state of being impaired in some way so that something is weaker or less effective. For instance, the law bans discrimination against anyone with a mental or physical impairment. Rehabilitation. Rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is the process of returning to a healthy or good way of life. For example, many amputees in the early stages of their rehabilitation feel despair. Ingenuity. Ingenuity. Ingenuity is someone's ability to think of clever new ways of doing something. As in, I was impressed by the ingenuity of the contestants. Legacy. Legacy. A situation that has developed as a result of past actions and decisions, either positive or negative. For instance, the success of the Olympic Games left a lasting legacy of benefit to the city. Inclusive. Inclusive. An inclusive group or organization tries to include many different types of people and treat them all fairly and equally. For example, our aim is to create a fairer, more inclusive society. One of my clearest memories of the London 2012 Games was watching 19-year-old Johnny Peacock stand in the middle of a packed Olympic stadium with nearly 80,000 fans screaming his name and then racing home to victory in the 100-metre race. London 2012 chairman Seb Coe said, Even the great Usain Bolt doesn't get his name chanted in the way Johnny Peacock did. It was spine-tingling stuff. If you don't remember this race happening at the Olympics, that's because it didn't. Johnny Peacock won the T44 100-metre race 
becoming one of the fastest leg amputee athletes ever in a Paralympic stadium with an incredible atmosphere. The Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games will start this week. The opening ceremony will take place on Tuesday 24th of August and the closing ceremony will end the Games on September 5th. Although the lack of crowds and the ongoing pandemic will make the Games a very different experience to London 2012 or even five years ago in Rio, the recent Olympics has shown that there can still be some excellent and exciting sporting events. I actually recorded a podcast at the beginning of the Olympics looking at the history and controversy surrounding the event, so check it out if you haven't already. The rest of this episode will look at the history of the Paralympics, what the Tokyo Paralympics has in store, and some other interesting information. So, what are the Paralympics? In the simplest terms, the Paralympic Games are the largest major international sports event for athletes with disabilities. They share many similar features with the Olympic Games. For example, they are split into summer and winter, um, they, which alternate every two years. They include many similar events, with, although some of the events are modified to help disabled athletes compete. And over the last 20 years or so, the Paralympic Games have taken place in the same city as the Olympics, shortly after they finish. I've mentioned athletes with disabilities a few times already. The Paralympics categorizes competitors into six different disability groups amputee, cerebral palsy, visual impairment, spinal cord injuries, intellectual disability, and les autres, which is not English, it's French, I think, and it means athletes whose disability does not fit into the other categories, including dwarfism. I'm not going to explain each of these disabilities in this episode. I'm not an expert. But I encourage you all to search yourself what they mean. And if you look on the blog, there are some links for you to click and have a have a look. Within these six groups, athletes are further categorized into more specific classes based on the type and extent of their disabilities. So when I was talking about Johnny Peacock at the beginning of the podcast, he won the T44 100 meter race. T44 was his classification um, and he competed against athletes with similar or perhaps comparable disabilities. While the Olympic Games trace their origin back to ancient Greece, the Paralympics have a much more modern origin. Sport for athletes with various impairments has existed for over a hundred years, but it was after World War II that the Paralympic Games were formed. The English town of Stoke Mandeville is often credited with being the birthplace of the Paralympic movement. Stoke Mandeville Hospital was opened in 1944 by Sir Ludwig Gutmann, um, a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany, with the support of the British government as a spinal injuries centre. It grew into a rehabilitation centre, hosting many soldiers and service people injured while fighting in World War II. Dr. Gutmann began using sport, and eventually competitive sport, as a way of treating and motivating his patients. On the day of the London 1948 Olympic Games opening ceremony, he organized the world's first competitive games for athletes with disabilities, with 16 injured servicemen taking part in an archery competition at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. This was the first step of the Paralympic movement. Four years later, in 1952, the Netherlands sent competitors to compete against the British team, and the disability sport became an international competition for the first time. 
The first official Paralympic Games were held eight years later in Rome, 1960, with 400 athletes from 23 different countries. In the years leading up to the Games in Rome, more types of disabilities were added to international competitions, and eventually the idea of one Games but different events for different disabilities developed. Since 1960, the Paralympics have been held every four years. And since the Summer Paralympic Games in Seoul, Korea, in 1988, and the Paralympic Winter Games in Albertville, France, in 1992, the Paralympic Games have also taken place in the same cities and venues as the Olympic Games. Of course, the Paralympics today looks very different to the first Games back in Rome. Like I said, the Paralympics in 1960 hosted 400 athletes from 23 countries participating in eight sports. London 2012 had more than 4,200 athletes representing 164 countries and participating in 20 sports. Tokyo will actually become the first city to host the Paralympics twice. The Tokyo 1964 Paralympic Games featured only 378 athletes from 21 countries, while now it is anticipated around 4,300 athletes will be represented at Tokyo 2020, with now 22 different sports featured. Taekwondo and badminton have been included into the Games for the first time. I always enjoy watching the Paralympics, sometimes more than the Olympic Games. As well as watching entertaining and high-level competitive sport, you can also see the incredible talent and ingenuity of athletes who have to think of creative solutions to manage their disabilities while they compete. I always remember seeing an archer using his feet to fire an arrow. I really recommend watching wheelchair rugby, which can be quite brutal but is highly entertaining. In the aftermath of both the Olympics and Paralympics, there are always discussions about the long-term impact and legacy of the events. For many cities that have hosted the Olympics, the long, in the long term, there has not been too many positive results. Uh, in Athens, for example, the Olympics and the Paralympics were one of the reasons Greece had such a significant economic crisis um, in the late 2000 and in the early 2010s. Um, and in other cities, for example, Rio, many of the stadiums are no longer in use and have fallen into disrepair. However, London 2012, for example, has been heralded as a success because for the first time ever, the British Olympic and Paralympic teams performed better four years later during Rio Games. Normally, Olympic teams do really well in their home Olympics and then not as successfully the next time. But in the UK, the funding has not just created talented athletes for one competition, but the impact is still being felt now. However, success on the field is just one aspect of judging the legacy of the Paralympics. London 2012 saw the names and images of athletes like Ellie Simmons and Johnny Peacock on billboards, on buses and in schools across the UK. Since the London Games, there are significantly more disabled athletes on British TV. Moreover, The Last Leg, a show hosted by two comedians, uh, both with amputations, which started as a short-term Paralympic chat show, has now become one of the most successful TV shows in the UK. The representation of disability sport through Paralympic broadcasting and wider media coverage seems to have improved significantly and negative perceptions are definitely being broken down every day. But have these positive perceptions filtered down to communities? Is Paralympic funding fair and has anything really changed for non-elite disabled athletes? These questions, I guess, are still up for debate. 
So how about the legacy of the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games? Will this Games change anything in Japan? Well, Japan is sending the most athletes in its history to the Paralympics and is aiming to build a more inclusive society as part of its legacy. According to a spokeswoman, the Paralympics won't succeed if we can't feel that people with disabilities can go out more comfortably and that people around them can change their way of thinking because of the Paralympics. If anyone has spent any time in Japan before, you will probably realize that it is not the easiest country for disabled people to live in. There are many shops, buildings and apartments not easy to access for people in wheelchairs. And often disabled students are sent to special schools, uh, not educated together with able-bodied students. According to Japanese team official Mickey Matheson, who uh, is now living in Canada but working for the Japanese Olympic team, life in Japan and North America for disabled people is very different. I'm often treated as a disabled person when I'm back in Japan, said Matheson, who uses a wheelchair. In Canada, I live without noticing my disability at all. She also said that there is a lack of opportunities for disabled and non-disabled people to work, study and live together in Japan, which makes people treat disabled people differently. It is hoped that a successful Olympics and Paralympics may help to make Japan a more inclusive and welcoming society for people with disabilities. So here is today's final thought. This episode of Thinking in English has looked at the history of the Paralympic Games, discussed what Tokyo 2020 will look like, and briefly touched upon the potential legacy. I really recommend you all to watch some of the events. As I mentioned right at the beginning of this episode, one of my best memories of London 2012 is actually from the Paralympics. Rather than pity or patronise people with disabilities, the Paralympics are an opportunity for all of us to admire the strength, talent and ingenuity of athletes from across the world. Are you excited to watch the Paralympic Games? What events are you planning to watch? Do you think the Games will be successful? Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please leave a review or rating, recommend it to your friends, or let me know on Instagram. My Instagram is Thinking in English Podcast. The link should be in the description. Uh, and make sure you check out the Thinking in English blog. I love hearing from listeners, and I really appreciate all of the messages I have received over the past few months. Feel free to send me a message or I don't know, give me some advice or recommend a topic. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.